Uh, my name is Lou Rosenbaum. I'm a founding member of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America and a member of the Chicago area of the League, and I'm your host for this conversation. Before we begin, I want to recognize that although we're not meeting in person and come from various places in the United States, it's still important to acknowledge that we in Chicago occupy unceded land that is part of the traditional homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Odawa, the Ojibwe, and the Potawatomi nations, who were forcibly removed from this land in the 19th century. Other tribes, including the Ho-Chunk, the Menominee, the Miami, the Sauk, and the Fox, also consider this region home. And many other Native people from diverse tribes, in part due to Chicago's role as a forced relocation destination in the 1950s, have called and continue to call Chicago home. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations. Therefore, uh, we want to acknowledge that there are over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois and one of the largest urban American Indian communities in the United States resides in Chicago. Members of this community continue to contribute to the life of this city and celebrate their heritage and practice traditions and care for the land and waterways. For millennia, the waterways of the Great Lakes have been critical resources for fishing, agriculture, and transport, which Native communities have continually cared for and worked to protect. Before we begin, I want to go over a few points to make this as open and engaging a space as we can have for an important conversation about power in America today. First, I want to tell you that this program will be recorded and placed on our website, our YouTube channel. If you don't want your beautiful face to be shown on screen, please change the video setting in the lower left corner of your Zoom screen. You may also change your name, if you wish, by clicking on the three dots to the right of your name in the participants screen. A dialog box will appear allowing you to change your name and we encourage you to use this feature to put your preferred pronouns next to your name. That makes it a safe space for everyone. And we also encourage folks to post links in the chat that will inform other participants of campaigns on which you are working, organizations you are part of or want us to know about, or reference materials you think will be helpful. That's another way we can further share your work and your wisdom. All registrants for this event will get a copy of the chat afterwards in an email, and so we'll be able to share it that way. Last, I wanna share a few community agreements that we've used over the past that generally make things run very well. Everyone is muted at the beginning, so you'll need to unmute your, yourself, uh, the audio icon in the lower left of your Zoom screen, when you talk. We encourage you to put your questions and comments in the chat. There will be plenty of time for discussion, and Mary Beth will be acting as chat master to bring to our attention when something pops up in, that the moderator and other participants should be aware of. When you wish to speak, please use the raise hand function in the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That way, the moderator will easily see you in order as you raise your hand. We don't wanna be interrupting each other and we wanna make space for everyone to participate, not just a dialogue between two people. Fourth, we aren't keeping a strict limit on how long each individual can speak but please try to be concise. Keep your comments and questions less than three minutes if possible in respect to other participants. Fifth, as best we can follow the concept of progressive stack favoring people who have not spoken already, again, we'll do this to get as much participation as possible in this conversation. Once you've spoken, please mute yourself again to keep the background noise down. When not speaking, please keep yourself muted. Please listen with respect 
and speak with respect toward your colleagues, your colleague participants. This is a mutual learning space. If we recognize that, we'll just do fine. So without further ado, I want to introduce the moderator for today's program, Eric Allen Yankee, who is a marvelous poet and also a member of the area office of the Chicago League of Revolutionaries for New America. Eric, would you please take it away? Oh, hey everyone. Thank you, Lou. Uh, welcome to our event for today. Um, I know we're gonna have a great discussion. I see we've got so many people here, you know, 26 people so far, doing good. Um, today we're, we're gonna have two speakers, um, two scheduled speakers. And of course we'll have our discussion where anyone will get a chance to talk. Um, our first speaker is Amani Sawari. Amani is the national coordinator of the Right to Vote campaign. Uh, the Right to Vote campaign is historic in its efforts to build a national movement uh, led from the inside prisons throughout the country. In collaboration with those formerly in the same shoes with the support of activists and allies to make every vote count. She is an artist and also publishes a bi-monthly right to vote newsletter. One of the projects of the campaign is an organization of young people called Chicago Votes. Yeah, Amani, ready? Or I can also introduce our, our second uh, speaker first too. Uh, that'll be Alan Harris, who is a LERNA member, journalist, translator, and independent scholar who is a member of the Rally Editorial Board. The Rally is the political paper of the League. Okay, thanks. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me. Again, I am Amani Sawari and I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much, Mary Beth, for inviting me to be here. It's amazing to see everyone coming together around this topic in this really critical moment. Um, just to talk a little bit more in depth about the work that I do with the Right to Vote campaign. It was established in 2016, 2017 um, through the work that prisoners were doing on the inside as a part of Jailhouse Lawyers Speak. So jailhouse lawyers is a common position inside of the facility, uh, legal uh, advocates in the jail who are jailed themselves, who support uh, their peers in their appeals, um, different types of caseloads um, they might not be able to afford an outside lawyer to work on. So the jailhouse lawyer role elevated from simply being a collaborative person on the inside that supports people um, with getting their appeal through um, to being a organizing force when it came to developing a uh, prison class um, and really recognizing the prison class. Um, so a few things that I'll touch on um, as I'm discussing this and things that I want you all to think about um, when it comes to political power in our day, it's really important for the class, the marginalized group to consolidate themselves as an organized body. And so a lot of people wouldn't think of the prison body as a class of people that have any sort of political power. But through the establishment of the right to vote campaign and other legal actions, the prison class elevated into a group that holds its own power. Um, so that happened through the establishment of some sort of community platform, a shared regular space to communicate which ended up being the Right to Vote Report, a printed publication, and I'll put the link in the chat as the other panelists speak. Um, and then also a shared collective values, which you all will see in the 2018 prison strike demands, which if folks have questions about de those demands, I'll put a link in the chat and I'd be happy to answer questions about them. And then finally shared uh, collective action. And so we've got the shared values and the demands, but shared collective action, it looks different depending on what someone's role is in the group or what privileges they have 
Um, for example, those those shared actions included boycotting uh, commissary, boycotting uh, phone calls. But for those who were in solitary confinement, they wouldn't have access to either. Um, so they would probably participate in a hunger strike um, or a, a sit-in or some other shared action, uh, that a co collective uh, action that folks were participating in during the national prison strike. So that's a little bit of the work I did. Um, I came into it uh, just through my writing. Um, folks on the inside reached out to me and asked if I would be willing to elevate their demands. Um, this was back in 2016, and I accepted that invitation. And, and ever since, um, I've been acting as their spokesperson for the national prison strike, as well as continuing to publish what was once No Shackles and is now the Right to Vote Report. So thank you all for having me, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Oh, okay. Um, Alan? Hi, Amani. How are you? Um, I, have a, I have a question. Is, um, is there a, uh, also a grouping uh, that, that you're associated with that's based here in Chicago called Chicago Votes? Yes, yes. So there were a lot of groups that participated in, in the national prison strike and elevated those demands, those calls, um, which included the ending prison slavery, um, making more humane conditions, um, revising different sentencing laws like truth and sentencing here in Michigan. And Chicago Votes was really instrumental in our area with bringing about the call for universal suffrage, uh, which is more of an acceptable term than what I often say, uh, an end to felony disenfranchisement, but they both mean the same thing. And Chicago Votes has definitely been a leader in the space of trying to ensure and advocate for incarcerated citizens voting rights that currently are eligible. So they were able to make Cook County Jail a polling place for those who are incarcerated in the jail that are eligible, which represents over 90% of those who are incarcerated there. Um, they didn't have access to the vote then, now they have access to the vote. Um, and they continue to fight for not only those jailed citizens who do have the right to vote, um, because they are not currently serving a conviction, but also for those who don't have voting rights. And so they currently are advocating for their voting in prison bill. I would definitely encourage everyone on this call to look into it. And if you are a resident of Illinois, writing your legislator and asking that that bill be taken to the next step in the process being voted on so that it can uh, get to the governor and be signed into law. Because we know that incarcerated citizens are citizens and they are impacted by the laws that are passed and they need to have a voice. They are represented when it comes to um, their body being counted so that the legislative seats that are being held on their behalf are uh, bolstered, um, but they are not represented when it comes to actually having a voice and having a dialogue with the legislature and also acting as constituents in, in their, their right. They are citizens. And so not having that dialogue has continued to contribute to dilapidated and depressed conditions behind the wall. And I'm really, really grateful to have a partner in Chicago Votes and those folks over there that are doing amazing work and, and really pushing the end of the spectrum further and further and further forward. Thanks for that question. Do we have any more questions for Amani right now? Yes, for her. Hi, Amani, I'm Hesu. Um, somebody asked for you to share the, the bill in the chat. There you go. So it's a voting in prison bill. And I know Chicago Votes has it highlighted on their website. So if you just look up Chicago Votes, think.org. They're collecting support and letters of support to send into legislators right now around that bill. How can we, how can they be uh, contacted? Chicago Votes. So contacted to send a, a, a letter of support Yes, and, and just in general. 
So Chicago votes um, for sending a letter of support. I believe that when you go onto their website and you see like the, the bill has a page and it shows the different steps towards it becoming a law. I think you can send it to your rep like they have the steps for how to do it. So it doesn't necessarily need to go to Chicago votes um, for you to execute that action. But if you just want to connect with Chicago votes, um, if you want to organize with them, if you're in the local area, they do dope events all the time when it relates to uh, trying to advocate for different bills, opening prison mail. Um, they do a lot of really cool stuff, bringing different artists in, um, the gas station. They have really cool garb that I probably should have wore today, um, but all about freedom and stuff like that. So if you want to connect with them, if you want to support them, the gas station does really great events. Um, they do shit talks on Instagram. Look them up on Instagram at Shy Votes. And connect with them there um, and just start paying attention to where, thank you for the link, chicagovotes.com. Connect with them on Instagram, start watching their lives, pay attention to when they're doing some event. There are so many cool events they do that I wish I could go to, um, but being all the way out in Detroit, I have to be selective what I can go to in Illinois. But if you guys can go, um, I would definitely encourage you to. Fabulous. Yes, Lisa, attend more dope events. That's how you meet more dope people like the ones here. Like if we weren't here, we wouldn't be connected to you all. And I, I encourage you all to connect with me. You all can reach me at amani.thawari at gmail if you'd like to connect with me. Um, and I can connect you to folks at Chicago Votes if there's like a specific thing that you're thinking about doing or specific questions that you have. Um, then I can find the right person and, and connect you directly that way. But that's just some general ways of just getting connected and getting supported. They're a super amazing organization, and I encourage you all to um, loop in with what they're doing, even if it's just watching their uh, progress towards the bill and, and chiming in whenever you can. That's very valuable. Okay. Um, don't see any any more questions. Anybody wanted to say anything? No. And you know, oh, while uh, we're the question, I see uh, Gloria and Sal have a question. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask uh, if Amani could relate some of what's happening in Florida. I know that. Um, they had uh, the issue of, you know, felons or previous felons, but I'm not real clear on all of it. If, if you know of that, could you share some of that information? Yeah, so all over the country, we're seeing the needle push forward towards restoring voting rights um, and gaining universal suffrage for everybody. And so Florida really sparked off the conversation with their allowing those who are formerly incarcerated to vote, to register to vote and to vote. Um, and this was, I think back in like 2019, 2018, I think I was still in college when I was talking about it, it could have been 2017, but they were the first to kind of spark up the conversation. Um, but then as the conversation sparked up, um, legislators started to pull back um, because they were actually setting a standard that maybe they didn't mean to set. Um, so instead of allowing formerly incarcerated folks to just register and vote as soon as they get out, which is the law of the land in both Michigan and Illinois. If you're not serving a conviction and you're out, then you can vote. Um, but even if you're pretrial, if, if you're in the midst of being convicted, but you haven't been convicted yet, you can still vote. So in Florida, they kind of flipped that on its head and made it more complicated by saying, if you owe any fines, if you owe any fees, then now you're, you still can't vote. So they, in the process of making that switch, there were folks who registered to vote, who under the law, as it stood, were legally eligible. Um, but because the law changed in the midst of that, now they were breaking the law. So they already registered to vote because the law had changed in order to allow them to, and then the law pushed itself back. And if they happened to owe fines and fees, now their prior registration was unlawful. And it, it's a big deal to register to vote or cast a ballot unlawfully. And so now these people were being attacked, even though, and, and this is what we're continuing to see ripple. They're being attacked and they're being targeted 
for having fraudulently registered or fraudulently casted a ballot, even though they were sent voter registration cards in the mail. And the reason why they were sent voter registration cards is because when they registered to vote, it was lawful. So the confusion happens when different entities, different institutions, for example, um, the state prison system isn't properly communicating with the county clerk in order to have some public database that's available on all the fines and fees people owe. There's no communication there. So to create a law based on that, there's going to be some fallings through the cracks as a result. And we even see this on the county jail level inside of the, the jails in states like Michigan, where the law just isn't common. There's no um, common understanding of who's eligible to vote. A lot of the conversations around who's eligible to vote aren't black and white. And so even when clerks go into the jails and they communicate language of you must be pretrial, then only folks who haven't been before the judge are going to sign up to register to vote when the actual language is you must be pre-conviction. And so folks who are pre-trial, who are in the midst of their trial, who are not pre-trial, have been cheated of the opportunity of registering to vote, registering to apply for an absentee ballot, receiving their ballot just because the wrong language was used. And so the, this is why universal suffrage is so important because different states not only create different policies around what it means to be pre-trial or what it means to to be um your sentence to be complete does that mean that you've now exited the jail does that mean that you've exited the jail and finished parole does that mean that you've exited the jail and finished parole and paid all your fees there's all these different gray areas that overlap and depending on whose jurisdiction you're under that is going to have the biggest weight on if you can exercise your right and that shouldn't be the case implicit biases are controlling people's access instead of actual policy being in place to protect people's access. So I hope that effectively answers that question. Okay, well, I see we have more questions, but we'll come back to those in a, in a few minutes. Um, right now, um, we have Alan Harris, who's going to speak. And again, just for those who are just joining us, um, Alan is a LERNA member, journalist, translator, and independent scholar who's a member of the Rally uh, Editorial Board, uh, the Rally being the political paper of the League. So thank you, Alan. Hey, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Imani. Actually, I, I have a, a question maybe for later on uh, about this uh, very issue, but I'm just going to uh, take a couple of minutes um, and uh, kind of outline um, what I think is sort of the, the strategic situation uh, at this moment uh, leading up to the uh, midterms. And, um, and basically what I'm talking about is, is the right wing. And it, it does have a bearing on uh, not only what's happening here in Illinois, but all in the rest of the Midwest, particularly up in, up in Michigan, uh, which is a, a serious situation, I, I think, in my view. Um, there's a lot to say, and uh, I'm, I'm not gonna say everything, but, um, and there was a lot I was going to say uh, before today, but then yesterday I, I went in my mailbox and I, and I found this, um, this came to me in the mail. It's, it's, a, it's a mass mailing to, to me and everybody else. And this is, uh, this is something that the extreme right is doing here in, uh, in Illinois during this, uh, during this campaign. And it's, it's in line with the, um, um, with the race by uh, an, a, legislate, a legislator from downstate named Darren Bailey. He's the Republican running for governor of Illinois against the incumbent, uh, J.B. Pritzker. So this, this is, um, 
this is some really uh, this is disinformation actually and uh and it's really foul uh propaganda and it's being uh pushed by a dude by the name of dan proft who is a um talk show host here in chicago on one of the right-wing uh, talk stations here and it's it's called the chicago city wire and they they put out uh, uh they put out editions for the north side the south side dupage county and places like this this is the um south side edition just for me uh because apparently um well i don't know why they did this so anyway it has um uh this is a uh, uh, special schools of gender pipeline edition and basically what they're doing is uh, uh attacking uh, basically not only jb pritzker politically but they're also waging a culture war and and a social war and the the strategy apparently for this in illinois is their path to victory is to win uh, basically everything downstate, downstate meaning the rest of Illinois, south and west of Chicago. Um, most, uh, most of the sub suburbs and then part of the uh, vote inside the city and inside the city, partly part of the black community. So, um, so it plants stories like this uh, this was a woman who um, ran against J.B. Pritzker in the Democratic primary, and um, basically she's, uh, she's encouraging uh, Black voters not to vote for Pritzker uh, and, of course, vote for, um, vote for Bailey, of course. So Bailey, um, back to this, uh, Proft runs a uh, right-wing pack and that pack is uh, backed by a billionaire by the name of uline dick uline and he has uh, he is backing uh bailey indirectly but he's also backing people across the country such as um such as lindsey graham and um and i think also ron DeSantis down in Florida, places like that. And um, judges down south. Yes, uh, basically the right, what I wanna say is that the right wing, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll finish, the right wing is leading a broad offensive uh, in this campaign. And the character of this offensive is not only political, you know, partisan against Democrats, but it's also social, social and uh, and cultural as well, and that explains um, this obsession that they have with um, the whole um, the whole issue of, of transgender transgender rights, which they are uh, very hysterical about. Yes, Uline Products. Um, that's uh, office supply company and it's based in wisconsin and uh uline is um runs that he is also an heir to the schlitz beer fortune as well and he's he's one of the largest donors in the country in fact um, he's donated uh, almost 200 million dollars of his money to all kinds of campaigns over the years and he's fourth. He's the fourth biggest donor in the country behind Michael Bloomberg, Tom Steyer, and the, uh, and the Adelsons. And so, um, yeah, that's right. Stop drinking Schlitz. Um, <laughs> I, li I like Mexican beer myself. Um, <laughs> but anyway, this is extremely serious. It's very broad. They see... Um, they see a chance, if not to steal Illinois or to capture the, the legislature or capture the governor's office, 
they they see a chance to to undermine um, not only um, the the black community, not only progressives here in in the state of Illinois, but but ac actually the political process itself. They're pushing they're pushing on all fronts. Uh, election denial, denial of the 2020 election. Uh, they're they're basically uh, uh, signaling that that this election, whatever the outcome is, it's going to be fraudulent, and they're going to fight that. And um, and it's and it's probably going to continue after the midterms, and probably even through the uh, municipal elections in Chicago. Um, which, uh, which is another situation. I won't dwell on that here, but broadly, more broadly, this is uh, being played out uh, all across the Midwest because the Midwest uh, does play an important role in in what the uh, the right wing movement, the Trump movement, the MAGA people, um, the um, the militia organizations, the armed, the armed extreme right, the Midwest plays a very important strategic role, and they want, they want as much as possible to achieve domination. And this has a bearing on on what's happening in, in Michigan as well. I'm I'm going to, um, I'm I'm going to uh, finish right here, but I want to leave a a link uh, for that you all can look at after, after this uh, program. And it's, um, it's from MSNBC, and it's an interview with a state senator in Michigan, um, um, Mallory McMorrow. So uh, what she has to say about that is actually very good. And uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to finish right now, but. It, if there are any questions about this, um, uh, any more discussion about this, I'd, I'd be you know, happy to continue that with you. So thank you. And um, I will hand it back to Eric. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, I know uh, right now we have another speaker. Um, I managed to talk him into to speaking here. Uh, Mark Kaplan, um, are you ready, Mark, to talk right now? Or oh uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, good afternoon, okay. everyone. My name is Mark Kaplan. I'm with a group called Northside Action for Justice. Um, we're a grassroots member-controlled organization fighting to build um, power for low and moderate-income folks on the north side of Chicago all over Chicago and really in solidarity with people around the world so we can um, build uh, racial, economic, and social justice. Um, so I guess just briefly, I, I think that, um, I mean, my background, you know, I, I've been in the movement quite a while, um, really dating back to the to the 60s when I, when I was a junior high and high school student. But um, more recently, I mean, my my background is that I was part of an organization called the Intercommunal Survival Committee, which actually was an organizing bureau of the Black Panther Party, working um, within the Black Panther Party structure, but with the mission, or not the mission, the, the responsibility or charge to work in um, communities where poor or working white people were living in um, to win those folks over to the black led struggle for justice. And I'm, I just mentioned that because it's in a historical context, right? Um, the Black Panther Party uh, and we view elections really as another survival program. So it's, you know, the ability to to win political power either locally or statewide or nationally really is is a program that um, that if we're successful at it allows us to um, be able to defend our communities and to uh, win resources that we vitally need to survive. 
And I think that's as true now as it was in, you know, in, in 1966 when the Black Panther Party developed their program or in 1972, which was the first time that the Black Panther Party was ever involved in electoral politics. Um, and that was around the presidential um, election and aspirations of Shirley Chisholm, um, who ran, you know, unsuccessfully, but ran a great campaign um, in the Democratic Party. Um, and then, you know, then they, then we moved into more um, kind of localized. So um, in uh, the, the base of Northside Action for Justice really is on the north side of Chicago, particularly um, the community that we, you know, that we've been working in um, really since the since the 70s is Uptown, uh, which has changed a lot. But the reason why we're in Uptown in the first place was it had the largest concentration of um, poor white people in, in Chicago and pretty much, um, you know, nationally as a, as a consolidated community um and you know that area in particular had a lot of poor white people who had um been pushed out of the south uh so poor white people from coal mining regions you know kentucky west virginia northern alabama um you know as well as farm people and people from other parts but i'm not going to this is a, this is a <laughs> we have a short period of time i won't go into the whole history um there's a book actually that just came out now called Daring to Struggle, Daring to Win um, by Helen Schiller. And she actually came out of our organization, but was the older person of the 46th Ward for 24 years. And it, may, it made a huge difference in terms of our ability um, in, a, in an area that has been facing extreme gentrification since the 70s um, to maintaining a large um, still a, a you know a fairly large community of of uh, of low income folks because we have a large amount of affordable housing um so i guess i just want to say two or three things one is that we know that whenever the people's struggle advances or whenever um you know we um win more political power there's always a right wing organizing um, you know, that's based on racism and really is a mobilization aimed um, specifically at working uh, middle class and low income white people. So consolidate a base um, that will then, along with their natural base of rich folks, um, you know, be able to win political power. One, two, I have to say that the right has been much more successful and much more focused on um, on fighting battles and winning political power um, on a state state level, particularly. And we see the ramifications today, where there's probably 35 or 36 states that have super majorities of the right. Um, and if you know how many states you need to pass national amendments, that's kind of about it. Um, so. We really need, you know, even though I'm not a huge fan of J.B. Pritzker and, and you know, establishment Democrats, we absolutely need, need as a survival program <laughs> to make sure that they win, right? At the same time, we really need to build local political power. Uh, and, and, you know, that's kind of looking towards the municipal elections that are in the next phase, but are coming on very quickly, right, in February of 2023. Um, I guess I just want to touch on, you know, so we know how to write organize and we know that they organize, you know, around, um, you know, a, a racial base and anti-worker base. And it's it's the same stock, you know, I mean, the particulars are different, but it's been the same stock organizing since Reconstruction, right? Um, and then, you know, more recently we see it uh, it, with Richard Nixon in 68 and th that whole mobilization of the right um, and a response. It's called, I mean, you know, George Jackson, who was a field marshal of Black Panther Party and was a leader of the prisoner movement who was, you know, killed in um, San Quentin prison um, in 1971, called the contrapositive mobilization, right? So it's mobilizing people against what their own interest is. So we know that that has been the case historically. Um, and 
when Ronald Reagan came to power in 1980, that was the case. Our experience in Chicago um, should highlight in some ways, though, the absolute importance of winning power at the municipal level, right, or local level. Because at the same time Ronald Reagan was the president, uh, we have a huge mass movement and then a political movement in Chicago that elected Harold Washington mayor in 1983 and then again in 1987. And with that, also the election of a lot of um, local all, older people, right, um, in tandem with, with, with Harold. Um, and why I'm pointing that out and why I think it's real important looking towards um, not just what's going to happen on November 8th, but what's going to happen on February 28th in Chicago is that because we held political power to a certain degree in the city of Chicago, we were able to um, withstand some of the fiercest attacks, you know, that were happening at the federal level under Reagan. And I think, you know, I think that, um, yeah, because we had, I mean, until 86, even though Harold was the mayor, I don't know if anyone saw the, there's that movie that just came out now, Punch Nine, I would, you know, I'm recommending if you haven't seen it, I think it's just in Chicago till October the 30th. And then I don't know if it's going to be, but that's, you know, all about the the uh, movement of campaign um, to elect Harold Washington mayor and then what happened afterwards. It wasn't until 86 that we really had a city council majority, right? And between 80, 80, 83 um, and 86, we had, uh, you know, 29 council members, again, um, you know, mobilized against, you know, mobilized through white racism um, to just, you know, fight everything that, everything progressive that Harold was pushing. But because, we, because Harold was the mayor, there were other things that he could do through city, um, through mayoral audit or through city departments. Anyway, I know time is short, so I'm not going to go on for a long time, but I just think that at this time, it really is important um, to, as much as possible, build our political power on the local level. One, you know, even though I'm sure all of us um, have extreme criticisms of the regular Democratic Party, um, and, you know, in some ways they're responsible for the situation that we are in. Um, I think that, you know, as a defensive measure, it's absolutely important to make sure that, um, you know, that the right wing Republicans that clearly are right wing Republicans um, are defeated on November 8th and that we build locally and citywide so that we can really we have the potential um there, you know, they're probably in in the majority of the wards around the city. There are people running for for all all the people, all the people, persons um, that really are, you know, on the progressive spectrum very strongly. Um, and you know, there's, I mean, Brandon Johnson, you know, announced his candidacy for mayor this week, um, and really, you know, comes out of an organizing background, uh, was a public school teacher and then organized for CTU and now is a county commissioner. Um, and there, I, you know, I was uh, involved in 83 also in the movement that led up to 83 and then following that. I think we really have the potential if we all work and organize in our local communities and along with um, people around the city to create a situation where, um, where, we have some protection municipally, no matter what happens on a national level. So I will end with that and uh, thank you for inviting me to this discussion. Oh, thank you, Mark. Um, so we uh, only have a short time left with Amani. So I was hoping we could return to Amani and uh, with any questions that people have. Anyone have questions for Amani? No? Sorry, everybody. I, I, I'm on. I was driving, but I do have a question really quick. Uh, 
Mari, that, uh, I like what you're doing out there. Uh, we're doing something similar, but with we're trying to uh, think about how to get our undocumented and those in, in formerly incarcer incarcerated here in California. I'd help them out as far as voting, but I know there's a controversial uh, issue that went down in Washington, D.C. Are you familiar with, with that vote where the city council was going to consider uh, non-residents voting? Uh, and are you working with anybody in that field? Thank you. Thank you for your question, Rafael. So uh, the the newest news that I'm familiar with in DC is uh, the incarcerated citizen who attempted to run for office um, for a council seat. Um, but I'm not aware of the, the movement for um, undocumented citizens voting rights, and I'm not as involved in that movement. Uh, but when I say universal suffrage, all people who are impacted by the law should have a voice um, because that's how democracy should work. And it doesn't work if there are folks within it that don't have a voice in, in how it operates. There has to be some pathway for dialogue with decision makers. And when there's no pathway for dialogue, then we're creating gaps for oppression um, and other uh, dilapidated conditions for those folks who, who don't have access. I can't be fooled into that. Sorry? I have a question. I have a question. Okay. Yeah, we were speaking about universal suffrage, and my name is Rhonda Cazalco, and it has to do with what uh, Rafael just asked. And I'm not, I'm sorry if I'm on the turn, but uh, it has to do with my feeling as a Mexican-American naturalized citizen or during in the Green Party that I feel that the youth and the undocumented immigrants and the immigrants with green cards are left out during elections and they're excluded. And um, so I would suggest or ask what people suggest with you apart from talking with them, which in the Communist Labor Party, we used to talk about using the election times to to discuss politics. It's an excellent time to discuss politics. Also, before my time runs out, um, we did do the Board of Education where undocumented were allowed to vote, but then that was taken to court and, and the people in the tube won. But I have a question about the orange tent I saw on TV that some guy donated orange tent to the people in Chicago, and I guess the city wants to sweep them. So I wanted somebody to talk about um, Chicago, what mayor they would propose, the guy, um, Alan said, some guy, I forget the name of Mark, uh, that, that would, uh, uh, that would be a better replacement to, to the mayor that, you, that is in Chicago. And I know you're in uh, Michigan, but uh, but yeah, so, and also that in New York, especially where they've been helping the immigrants, crime is a big factor, the same in California, it's spreading throughout the country and watch out for the, the quote unquote soft and crime blaming the Democrats. Democrats for, for the Russian crime. It's called fascism. It's corporate fascism. That is the criminal government protected corporate fascism. So I wanted to ask somebody in Chicago or you, or you want money, how would you would address some of those uh, situations, those problems, those concerns? Because I know uh, I heard the last weekend two youth, one 15 to 20 were killed in a gang related incident in Chicago at four o'clock in the morning. And I feel as, um, that as, as a Mexican American, that it's our responsibility to make outreach to the youth and undocumented and, to, and the prisoners definitely. So ha, ha, what, uh, do you know who the mayor, a good person to vote for about the orange tent in Chicago would be? Because or, or what effort you could do from below to, to prevent the, 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 the want to get rid of these orange tents that, are, that were built with warmer capacity and the guy donated them. I, I, I read that in the news. So what, what would you suggest I mean, yes, I don't know if you know because you're in Michigan, what person from, or they could repeat the name of that person so I can write it on Facebook for mayor in Chicago. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the with the candidates, 
um, running in Chicago, but I'm, I'm sure there's someone else on the panel who could speak to who would be the best candidate. Um, but I do want to speak to um, when it comes to uh, disenfranchised, undocumented citizens. Um, I think there's a lot of overlap between how undocumented citizens are treated when public policy discussions are happening and with incarcerated citizens. I think there are there's a lot that both groups could learn from one another because our for that they provide in order to maintain its economic power status. And so when incarcerated citizens choose not to provide labor or choose to expose the fact that their labor is what is the essential point in um, closing gaps that are uh, created when our society isn't functioning as needed on the outside. For example, when, when essential workers weren't allowed to be out, incarcerated workers were making the hand sanitizer in Georgia. Incarcerated workers were making the bodysuits in Washington. They were making products they weren't even allowed to use to protect themselves inside of the facilities where they were forced to make them. And so when we look at extracting that labor, even the threat of, oh, the price of phone calls went down 10 cents. Or we see these little, these little, uh, little tidbits, nuggets that were given to just keep us going a little bit further until the next breaking point. When we're instead of stopping, got free phone calls, no need to continue the, to continue the fight. No, we, we got free phone calls in California, but people are still paying to talk on the phone to their family members across the country. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that we recognize that there is unity in our struggle across different community groups, especially groups that we don't think of. We don't think of them because we are coached not to think of the, the folks that we are, are alongside of in this struggle. We're coached to just look up at those folks that we're trying to be the wealthy, the powerful. Um, but when we look alongside, we see undocumented citizens fighting for the same thing incarcerated citizens are fighting for. So I would love to help bridge those gaps. I think there's a lot of communication that can happen even just in print and publication in trying to bridge those gaps in order to push shared values forward through some sense of shared action. We don't know what that is yet, the shared actions, but we can identify what some shared values are and, and continue to build from there. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Yep. Um, hey, Sue had yeah. a, a question. Okay, I have actually, I know, I know it's, it's true. Uh, Amani, I loved your presentation and I'm so inspired. I know like, I hate when people tell me that, but I'm so inspired because I am an English professor and you've managed to get your cultural work done by writing a blog, which is super dope. Um, and all the other hard work, which I know takes up a lot of time. So thank you for that. But my question was for Alan. I don't know if you saw my long question. It has to do with, um, any, any of y'all three, it has to do with the power of voting. And we we in the league talk about um, not really advocating for candidates, although through my union work, um, and because I am a member of the Chicago Teachers Union, it's Cook County College Teachers Union, and a member of United Working Families, um, the political committee, as, as Mark is as well, uh, advocating for Brandon Johnson, right? But I think what's important is to see how how so many of these candidates are, are genuinely progressive, are capturing the hopes and dreams, the the um they're fighting for the basic needs that people need. So I, I and but the thing that frustrates me, and and I've talked, we talked about this before, and I know we're aiming for the middle. I get this. But we're, we're pushing for this November 8th. We don't want those fascist judges elected, even if it's South, because it's going gonna... to give it away, ladies. Your women's rights are going to be gone if these people are elected. If Bailey gets elected, I'm moving to fucking Italy. I'm out. I'm just, that's it. Because it's true. I mean, Illinois plays such a key part in terms of labor. It's one of the few bastions of labor. If the fascists win, we have a much harder fight up ahead of us. It's not easy yet. It's not easy now. It's not easy with, with Pritzker, right? But how, how do we motivate people that are woke? I mean, people that understand capitalism, people that understand racism and are disenfranchised and will not vote. Because I'm like, oh my God, what the fuck, dude? I'm sorry. I'm like, seriously? I mean, to me, voting is such an important thing. Now, you talked about restricting the voting of prisoners, talked about gerrymandering. Look at all the crap they've been doing in Arizona. And is that the way it's South Arizona and Florida? I mean, this is real. This is real. These mother effers are coming to win. 
And I think right now, it's not the time to be like, oh, vo voting is not important. No, no, no. This is a move against fascism. We got to use that power to vote. So that was my question. And then I have another question for Brother Mark, but maybe after this one, if that's okay. Well, Mark, I just want to know if the Black Panther Party is active and if you know how to get a hold of Elaine Brown. That's about it. Go ahead, uh, brothers and sister and others. Okay. Um, that's a big question. Um, uh, just the whole issue of voting. I, I, I think here in, in this group here, I mean, it doesn't need, it doesn't need much, um, uh, doesn't need much uh, persuasion. Um, it certainly makes a difference if we're, if we're, uh, if we are uh, still able to cast a ballot today and then waking up uh, someday in the future and we can't, it certainly makes a difference. Um, voting is important. And I think in, in this environment, um, voting is, um, is more effective and um, it's more effective if, if, um, if there is a, a, a united effort in the vote in the voting, if there is a uh, if there is a specific direction, if there's a if it is toward a a uh, a programmatic goal, in which uh, we 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 uh, through our votes we ultimately obtain satisfaction of all the all the basic needs that that um, the vast majority of people need in this society. That is really what's at stake. Um, every day, every day of our lives, election day, and and beyond. That's really what's at stake, and that is, uh, and the right wing knows that probably better than than anybody else. So, to give you an example, Hesu, uh, back to um, back to this dude, uh, Uline. Um, one of the things he's uh, financing in, in this cycle right now is um, is uh, defeating the workers right workers rights amendment so for all, all of us who are here in Illinois uh, it's on the ballot I think it's called amendment one and uh, basically the workers rights amendment would amend the uh, state constitution here here in Illinois to guarantee um, uh, to, to guarantee that Illinois does not become a right to work state, uh, that the right wing cannot, you know, uh, defeat uh, the right to, to organize and, and bargain collectively inside the state of Illinois. Dick Uline is, is financing that. Um, that's, that's partly what I mean by the, by the, the wide offensive you know, it's it's really a war. I, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're, they've really declared war. It's it's part of this wide offensive. It's part of this ongoing coup, which which they're they're still running, which started back in 2020 through January 6. It's still going on now. It's it's uh, it's its ultimate goal, in my opinion, is 2024. Which is um, which, in which they want to win all the marbles. Um, it's it's part of that that broad offensive uh, um, inside the electoral process, outside the electoral process, uh, in uh, a social offensive and a cultural offensive, in order that uh, a certain part of, of this society, a certain part of this country achieves total dominate, come back, achieves total domination um, and, and uh, over the rest of us and, and total power over the rest of us. So it's, it's a fight. It is a fight for not only a fight for our, our values and a fight for what we believe in, but it's, it's, it's literally also a, a fight for our lives you know, based on who we are uh, in, in, in a class society. I'm, and I'm done. Oh, 
Hey, I saw that Lisa had a question. I don't know if it's so much a question, it's a response to some of what I've heard as far as voting. And I, I hear and I feel uh, the frustration. Uh, I will tell you, I mean, we can be frustrated all we want. We can say you're wrong, why can't you see it? But if we don't do the work, and it starts with baby steps of helping them to see it for themselves. Um, I work with, with youth and part of my job is keeping them from being enticed by the power that gangs offer them, by the power that uh, substances offer them, be that real or not. But what I do know is they want power. Now, the system right now is doing all that it can because they control the narrative to tell our youth that they don't really have any power, to tell uh, minority people, people of color, BIPOC people, that they don't really have any power. So the answer when you have a conversation sometimes is, well, what the fuck difference can I make? And it's valid. I mean, it's valid that you're hearing that from them because that's actually what they're, they're feeling. But let's meet them where they are. Uh, I earlier had said, let's let's start what uh, Miles Horton did in uh, Tennessee in the Highlander schools and what uh, Pablo uh, Fiore did in Brazil when he's talking about illiterate po people not having any power. Uh, the Highlander school was the union movement, right? And then he moved into the civil rights and you have Septima Clark, each one teach one. And the beauty of what he did there. Uh, and nothing is perfect, but the beauty of what he did there is a lot of the union people who came up did not want black people to be coming into that school. Where Miles said, nee, you know what, if you don't like it, leave. And they had to suck it up and they realized they weren't as in danger as they thought they were very much like Mark was talking about earlier when you talked about Young Lords and the Black Panthers. And I forget the group in, the, in Uptown that came together, something Patriots. Here these people came together because they realized that their fight was similar. So just putting it out there, um, the way that I work with youth and the way that I work with undocumented people, uh, women uh, in domestic violence, situation, which is running amok in Latin America, but that's another point, um, circles, dialogues, being able to sit with someone you may not totally agree with and listen actively, not to argue, not to change their minds, but those uh, environments created, you know, start making them question what they thought was the absolute truth. So it helps um, I think it, it helps them see something from another side and maybe they do change their mind and see their power. For kids, I always tell them, you want, this is a power given to you when you were born in this United States of America. You're just giving it away? I don't care if you go in and you vote for Mickey Mouse. That's your power. And the fact that you showed up scares them. So that's, that's my piece. I still know it's frustrating, but the work we have to do is slow and it's very bottom up community, at least from my point of view. I know the top down, but I don't do that real well. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're uh, about to go into our break, but we have a video first um, to play for you. Then we'll take a five minute break and then uh, come back for more discussion. So. Thank you for, thanks to the Schomburg to, uh, and Kevin for bringing me on this amazing um, uh, cipher we got going tonight. And uh, I'm gonna tag, I'm gonna go back a little while and uh, tag an ancestor in here named Langston Hughes who wrote a poem 85 years ago that's so relevant today because of its title, which is adverse to the title we see people wearing on these ridiculous hats. So this is entitled, Let America Be America Again. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. 
Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great, strong land of love where never kings collide nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the man, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker, sold to the machine. I am the Negro, servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry. Yet today, despite the dream, beaten yet today, oh, pioneers. I am the one, I am the man who never got ahead. The poorest worker bartered through the years, yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a serf of kings. Who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turn that's made America the land it has become. Oh. I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lee. And torn from black Africa's strand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me, the millions on relief today, the millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have nothing for our pay, for all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet, and yet must be. The land where every man is free. The land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain from those who live like leeches on the people's lives. We must take back our land again. America, oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. All right, great uh, reading. Great performance of that poem by Tyhimba Jess, uh, Chicago's own Tyhimba Jess. Um, yeah, so we're back for our second half of our discussion. Um, let's see, we have, uh, you know, still Alan and Mark who can take questions. 
Carmen, I had asked a question. It just kind of lost in the shuffle. My question was for um, Mark. Um, is the Black Panther Party still active? I keep hearing a lot about them, and I think it may be because I don't want to say old, but some of the more seasoned comrades are coming back to the streets, right? And if they are coming back, how can we connect with them? And I wasn't being flippant. Do you know how to get a hold of Elaine Brown? Because we were like looking for her a couple of weeks ago and I couldn't find her. Um, just, just to see if she would come to a cultural convention. And anyway, that's all. Uh. Um, so I mean, a couple of things. One is there's um, there's a group in the Chicago area called the um, Black Panther Party Cubs. And it's actually a lot of them, some of them are actually um, children of people that were involved in the party, you know, in, in the 60s. One of the leaders is um, Fred Hampton's son, um, Fred Hampton Jr. Um, What's he like, Mark? Is he like his dad? Is he like... He looks kind of like his dad. And he's, he's a good speaker. Anyway, one of the things they, they did um, successfully is they were able to get the um, Hampton the, the house that Fred Hampton grew up in in Maywood uh, declared like a historical landmark and they actually restored it. And I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe that like it's kind of like a museum also. Um, so they're, they're active. Um, and I know that there's other formations nationally that are groups, you know, there's a group called the New Black Panther Party, New Africa Movement or... I'm not I, I'm not expert on that though, but I, you know, I know that you know the legacy of the Black Panther Party certainly is around. And in terms of Elaine Brown, I, I can check with some people to see um, see if I can get contact information for you, and then I'll. I think I mean I think I know I do know some people who have been in touch with her at least over the last couple of years. So. I'll see if I can get contact information for you. Actually, one of our comrades just posted the link. You do not believe how how much I Googled and looked on Twitter and so, Jesus Christ, I must have been doing something wrong. Mark, thank you for that. That's super helpful. And thank you for that report. Spot on, dude. Sure. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll get you that info, though. I'll try to get it. I'll let you know if I can. All right. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Yolanda. Yeah, I don't I understand. I understand the going fascism. I voted for Biden so that documented immigrants will not get deported. I I regret that, especially since I found out that Obama and Biden were part that they, they were in charge of helping the Nazis in the Ukraine in 2013 gain power among the military and the police and they were responsible for the death of, for kill, they killed 13, over 13,000 Russian and Ukrainians. So now I found out that I regret um, supporting um, Biden but my question is this in 2010 in California the, the Democratic Party channeled that so that any third parties could not participate in the elections in November. Up to the primaries, we can participate. But they said instead of every person in each party being on the final ca candidate ballot, only the top two parties. So we're left out. Right now, we're here in San Francisco with the Green Party, we're, we're endorsing, we're supporting. Um, Hamasaki for the district attorney, he's a Democrat because he's more progressive than the other ones. We're also supporting two, the, the, and he's a Democrat, two public defender candidates because uh, uh, the progressive Chesa Boudin, son of David Gilbert and Katie Boudin, he, he, he was recalled. So we, I, I still distribute the Green Party leaflets and, and, and I do talk with people. I do uh, talk to people in Spanish and I, we just get cards to everybody whether they can vote or not. But how, how, what, do you, what do you suggest as far as California? Because the guy that's governor, not Gavin Newsom, he passed care code, which would mandate mental health treatment and, men, and mental health medicine to all homeless 
and house people. 70% of the people at the Dover Girls from Fenton on the seventh quarter, 700 people are, were housed. So, so that's why I, I'm been really anti-democratic party because I was democratic party until Obama said he was going to keep the troops in uh, Afghanistan after um, when he was elected. So, but what what do you say to somebody like me to some of the Greens that did not endorse Bernie Sanders a second time around because the Green Party asked him to to run with the Green Party at, when it was the, when Trump won. Um, and and uh, we would support him. As I, uh, and uh, he and he we, he didn't even answer us. I I'm not I'm I'm not that up on um, um, the political situation in California vis-a-vis -vis the Democratic Party, you know, and and all their machinations on the inside. Um, but I, I think I, I do have an opinion, uh, and, and I'm, if there are any people here who are from California, um, you know, they can probably, you know, take, take this up. But um, it's, we've got um, those of us who are um, in the broad left, the, the progressive, on the progressive side of, of this country, um, the, the, the complication that we're up against, you know, as we as we struggle, is that a um, there's the you know the right wing that I was talking about, but at the same time, uh, we're always uh, election after election, we always find ourselves boxed in by the the Democratic Party establishment, and 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 they they work to make sure. Um, Yolanda, that um, that there is no third party, especially no um, people's third party, to uh, to contend with whenever in, whenever the general election comes around. Basically, um, they um, they will they will let you you know wage an insurgency inside the democratic primary process and and all of these campaigns the the sanders campaign the jackson campaign in the 80s and um and and earlier than that uh the uh, the anti-war campaigns back in this back in the 60s you know we're, we're inside the democratic party and they 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 let us you know run around in, in circles and use up all our energy and exhaust ourselves and then they and then they they cut it off and we're all we end up with you know uh, Hubert Humphrey and and everybody else who they want to um, who they want to uh, nominate and then we're we're expected to just you know sit down and line up and. And, and vote for them. This is what happened in 2020. Bernie Sanders was actually the front runner in the in the 2020 cam, uh, primary campaign, and then uh, and then he wasn't the front runner anymore because because Jim Clyburn, uh, you know, torpedoed torpedoed Sanders, and so um, and so now or, or so there we were in 2020 can't have we can't have bernie sanders he can't be the nominee gotta be joe biden the the worst the 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 back runner fourth place fifth place um candidate in the primaries he's he's now the nominee and we've all got to vote for him why because if you don't vote for him you know trump will get reelected. you know and that kind of thing so okay so everybody voted for for biden i voted for biden I did not want to vote for Biden, but I vote. I voted for him anyway. I'm sorry I voted for Biden. I wish I wish I could go back and do something else uh, than that. And you know, here here we are again. Um, this this cannot. This is just my view. This cannot go on forever. Um, I don't think we have any we don't have very many more elections in the future where we can just run around in circles like this. Um, there has to be, uh, there has to be an outcome to this. Um, the democratic party establishment, um, 
will collapse, I think. It, it will collapse and, um, and the, party will, the party will split. And where that split goes, the progressives I'm talking about, the left, the left side of the party, all these people who are running on the left inside the Democratic Party are going to have to uh, um, declare their independence. You know, that we we need we need to to win uh, the fight for our own political independence if we're going to obtain everything else that that we we want to obtain program, programmatically in terms of basic needs. I that's that's my opinion. Um, sooner it's going to happen sooner or later, but it's it's going to happen, and then um, and then we'll we'll be be free to to organize and grow and 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 win we are the we are the majority there's there's more of us uh whether it's the cultural divide social divide economic divide we are we are the majority but if it, if the majority is is not united if the majority is split up you know 10 different ways then then any any minority such as the billionaires can can defeat us, you know, uh, uh, in in the electoral process or outside the electoral process. I wish my camera would would, would focus. So um, that is um, that's my view in, in general, Yolanda. As, as for California, like I said, if if, uh, if we have someone here from California who can uh, who can take up that aspect, um, you know, I. I, I'd, I'd like to uh, hear that. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Yolanda. All right, uh, we have uh, questions from some other people now. Um, I believe uh, Raisa is first. Um, hi, yes. Um, I just wanted to respond. I am in California. Um, we don't have any magic. Um, solutions here. I live in Oakland, um, where we do have ranked choice voting for our mayoral campaign. And um, when I first had that opportunity, I was so glad because I got to vote my values for the first time, um, even though I knew my candidate wasn't going to win. But I'm seeing um, how even that, um, because right now we are seriously at risk for um, getting another eight years of the current administration, even though the current mayor is termed out um, and we can't afford to have that. So it's, uh, so we're, so those of us who are quote unquote radical um, are being advised that we can't afford to put our safety candidate as our third choice because we can't risk um, getting what we'll get if we don't have a strategy. So it, it, it's, it's what Alan was talking about, us working together, because if we had a really good, strong strategy and we were all working together, we wouldn't have to worry about that. But, but we are splintered in ways that we're not, we don't work well together and we can't sadly afford the risk because we don't have that strong together. So we just, on the ground, we have to keep talking to each other, keep figuring out how we work together. That that's our route to success. It's building, building. Well, the reason why I assume we're in this room. I, I learned about you all recently, and I'm glad to know about you all. Um, so thank you. Hi, this is Ethel. Oh, I could speak to that California question also. Certainly, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, sorry, I didn't get to hear the comments before yours, but I did hear your comments, Alan. Um, and I think I was Yolanda maybe who had uh, spoken earlier That's and right. now Risa. Um, I, I think that what you laid out, I mean, who, what, well, here are our choices um, in 2020. Um, you know, 
just set it out and be correct and, um, and continue to allow our class to be assaulted and driven to slavery or utilize the conditions that confronted us and uh, build towards the vision and the, um, and the, the, the needs of our people. And I think that, hold on, I, I've just gotten called to work. Sorry about that. I'll have to come back another time. Okay, all right, hurry back. Um, Lou has his hand up. Go ahead, Lou. Actually, Merle had her oh, hand up before you're I did. Right. Okay, so, very good. Yes, Merle, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for putting together this uh, really good forum. So I wanted to follow up on the last couple of calls. So we all know that we're the majority, if we can organize ourselves, or potentially the majority, that the working class is being beaten up and this kind of war from the ruling class and all of that. But what do we need to do to, to change that? It seems like somebody raised the question of strategy. And I think, you know, so it's not like there's a lot of discussion. Should we vote for Democrats or vote for the Greens or, or should we do? And I think it's not one or the other. I think we have to look at the situation we face, which is we're facing pretty existential danger from the right. And if we were stronger, our people's movement and left was stronger, then we could mount our own frontal challenge. We're not there yet, although we want to be there in the future. So then I think we're kind of on one level stuck with voting who, for whoever will defeat the right and make sure they don't come into more majority. Um, and also at a narrative level, and at the same time, building independent political line and action and, and organizing. And I think the other thing I want to say is that we have to do that starting, like people have said before, where people are at. So now we have groups, we have a lot of kind of NGO-ish groups, and I'm glad to see people here are doing direct organizing, but we have a lot of groups that are issue-based. And so there's, we have a lot of great stuff out there on different issues, but in the current situation, the left does not have much to say about the economy, like inflation, right? So that's an issue for working class people, right? We can't afford to buy stuff, but we're letting the right take that. We're basically, we've got a good position on reproductive rights, on Black Lives Matter, on, but we're not dealing with economic issues. We're not dealing with the danger to Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare in the ways we could. So how do we basically have a, a more united left with a strategy that addresses the issues from where people are and also from what our, our politics takes us to in a way that we can win. That's a short way of saying, but I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you, Merle. Um, so um, looking up, uh, Eric. Oh, um, yeah, after uh, you're done, Alan, Lou will be next. Okay, well, Lou is next, go ahead. Um, maybe what I should do is is allow, I mean, Ethel had her hand up and had to leave. So maybe we, Ethel should finish what her comment was, and I'll go after her. Okay. Ethel? Thank you, and thank you all for your patience. Um, a part of my life besides movement is caregiving. And so uh, duties, uh, there are always duties. Um, let me see, um, but I'm actually going after the uh, sister who just spoke also, because I think that she raised um, important stuff. So partly, I think that this question uh, that we have in our favor that um, really has percolated from what I can see, and you tell me uh, what you're thinking of this, Alan, from about 2016 forward, because if you think about what did Bernie Sanders do? He ran on an economic platform. He ran on a basic needs platform. And we, our class was shut out. I mean, the Democratic Party says, you can have any damn body, Mickey Mouse, any damn body, but no damn Bernie. And, and we can all remember how he was shut out through the, on the platforms, um, uh, media. The clown that got all kind of media was the fascist Trump, right? And they say, oh, look at this idiot, you know, but yet they gave him all kind of airtime. And he, he bra bragged about it later about, how all that free airtime was really great. Now, how does that relate to what the question about um, 
of voting. So I think what we began to see um, kind of um, matriculating, and I, I guess I put it even as far back as 2012, but with the rise of the Tea Party and such, um, that people began to, a section of our, of our of society, the working class, began to see we can take our demands for basic needs into the electoral arena. Now we would probably say, well, that's not so different. Workers have been doing that for a long time. But the question of taking their insurrection into the electoral arena, that to me is a very different thing. And I want to just make my case about that because I, I too live in Oakland. And um, we have seen the how these things have really inter, um, they, they, um, they're interlocked. The rebellions to keep our schools open and the fight to have housing in Oakland, they have really been so, they've been so fluid, more like a river running together uh, than not from the standpoint of the advocates who have fought for uh, the people. And um, I think that we are seeing a distinction there. So I kind of, I guess you could say between 20, definitely 2016. Uh, so I think, I think it's earlier than 2018. And I think that that's distinctive. Um, and I think, um, so now let's fast forward, Lisa, to where we are right now in Oakland. We have, um, um, and somebody was speaking earlier about um, people who are either non-citizens or young people having the right to vote. Our young people here fought for about two to four years and got the right to vote for people, uh, I think as young as 16 or 17. They were disenfranchised by the system in Oakland that did, and excuse me, in Alameda County that blocked them from being able to, um, being recognized and being able to vote in this election. And this election is a, a, a big one, but nonetheless, that the young people did the street organizing and the ballot box issues is very connected. So I think that what I want people to take away is that they're not one or the other. There's a continuation of this protest at the ballot box, in the streets, you know, uh, in, at our different places uh, for, for getting unionized. This is a social movement that is threatening to become a social revolution. And I think that that's what we are, we're trying to quantify and, and, and express. So last main point, and I'll shut up after this, I promise. Um, um, so now we have, with the ranked choice voting, we had at least three candidates. We probably had more, but the other ones were either, they were not allowed to vote or kicked out. But we have three progressive candidates that a progressive slate of people in our city are saying, uh, vote for these three. They are, are, are dedicated to housing the unhoused. They are dedicated to um, addressing the issues of um, affordable <laughs> housing. We have three measures, uh, four, four measures uh, on our local ballot that are about providing extremely low income housing for 13,000, build new housing for 13,000, extremely low. That you couldn't get that if, uh, separate and apart from a, a, a movement, even though the leader who was fighting for that, Carol Fife, is outstanding. But the two go together. So I think that um, we're seeing, while the election arena is not the only place that people are fighting for their lives, even frankly, um, upper class like, Abrams and Beto, they're finding to be successful, they've got to fight for basic needs and defend democracy. So I think we have to think out of this beyond the left. We have to think about our neighbors, our, our friends, our family who have, are being impacted. And I thought, I, I just saw Reverend Barber on somebody's show. Oh, Dre, uh, Reed, and I'm not, I don't even like her, but he did a great job. He talked about if 140 million poor people knew the power they had to exercise their voice through vote, even in those slim margins, we would have had much bigger victories. So we have to keep using it as a school for revolution. And I think that those are the ways to think about that, not in a, in a narrow way. And we can already see, certainly that's why the fascists are trying to destroy the electoral democracy process. I'll shut up. You probably, sorry that you even asked me to come back on, but I, I wanted to make sure I answered that question for you. It, basic basic needs is you know when you when all is said and done, basic needs is everything you know, and you don't have to be on the left to be to be in favor of uh, food and you know housing and 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 healthcare and and all of all of those things. You know it's uh, it's human, but. Uh, 
who who will um, who will win all of these things? You know, is it is it the billionaires? They're going around. You know, they're going around privatizing everything. They're 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 soaking up all the money in sight and and spending it on on you know. 15, 15 bathroom houses and, and wars. Um, it, it's, it's a question of power. It's a question of who, de who decides how all this, all this wealth and abundance in this country is, is going to be used. And in fact, it's, it's a question of who's, who's going to determine what the future of this country is going to be, to tell you the truth. It, and it, it all comes back to basic needs, no matter what you say about anything else. It, it always comes back to that. And who, who is, who's going to, you know, get the groceries for us, you know? So, uh, Lou, you are up next. Okay. Well, you know, it, it's hard to follow the uh, comments that, that uh, Ethel uh, presented to us because they're so on point. And drawing on what Risa and uh, Merle have said, I think uh, we're really talking about a nodal change that's taking place in American history today. This is a different time than the 1960s. And, you know, Mark and I uh, lived through that period. I was a little older than Mark, but I remember the, the Black Panthers in Los Angeles, and he remembers the Black Panthers here. And a very important period and very important struggles, a very important part of, of American history, which uh, the Poor People's Campaign and, and Reverend Barber refer to as the second reconstruction. But we're on the verge of a new reconstruction, a reconstruction which has never happened before. And the reason that we're in the kind of mess that we're in right now is because the people who are in power are unable to do anything except repress that motion, that social motion. So that's the political problem that we face. It's a good place to be in, in a way, because it shows really how weak they are. If all they, they can no longer depend upon currying favor with a section of the working class. They can't depend on that. They're shooting themselves in their own foot, but they're very good propagandists. And that's one reason why what both Merle and, and Reza spoke to in terms of the divisions, that's one reason why they're able to maintain themselves as well as they can. But they're reaching the end of their rope. And that's and that's shown, I think, by the kind of comments that that uh, Ethel was making in terms of the way in which the demands that people have been making for generations are coalescing into uh, a, you know, what I think Alan referred to earlier as programmatic demands. What they're doing is they're actually putting before the legislatures and the powers that be solutions that can, that ways in which we really can solve the problems. There are people who are saying there's no reason for there to be anybody homeless in America because we have enough housing. There are people who are saying there's no reason for any to, anybody to have to pay for health care anymore because we have the health care. It's not, it's not a scarce commodity. And I agree with what Ethel said that we one of the one of the things that that is so important is to look beyond what we what we have those of us who came from the 60s have defined as the left because what is the real left today is that section of society which is Alan talked about it is fighting for its basic needs that's what the real left is in America today, and that's what what we uh, what we see as the kind of social force that has a real capacity to change society. And so, I, I just wanted to say 
that that's what the stakes are in this election. And it sounds like, you know, I'm saying the elections don't count, but that's not really true. What I'm saying is that the elections are a format within which we express our demands. And we have to use that format to whatever extent it, it, it is possible. Now in, in Illinois, Alan described very well, we have a fascist who is running for governor. Now on the Republican party, the Republicans gave a, a choice of three or four different fascists that we could have voted for. But only one of them was able to be on the ballot. So we got that one too. But it's very clear that if that fascist gets in power, we are in serious trouble. We are in very serious trouble. Pritzker, no great shakes. But this, <clears throat> this guy, from the southern part of Illinois, who everybody should recognize the southern part of Illinois was almost part of the Confederacy. It might as well have been. And this guy is coming right out of that. If we look at what is ha what happened in January 6th, that was a uh, <clears throat> that was out of the end of the the begin of the um, that insurrection was no no different from what the South attempted to do prior to the Civil War. So what, I, what I'm really trying to emphasize here, one thing and one thing only, and that is that we may not have the best choices in front of us, but we do have some opportunities to block the fascists. And in the process of doing that, find the many revolutionaries who were involved in those processes as well and link with them. Uh, we have some good candidates running in Chicago, but believe me, whether they run in, whether they win or not, isn't as important as whether we are able to make the connections with all the good people who are helping those candidates to fight for their victory. That's the message I think is really key here. And um, and the last thing I want to say, believe me, there's a, this is this will be the last thing, and that is we're in a process here. We're not at the beginning or the end of something. We're in, in inside a process, and the process that is developing is the process whereby the class of which we are a part develops a political expression. We don't have such a political expression now. There is no political party that represents the most marginalized of us, but it's coming, it's developing, and you can see that <clears throat> in the way in which even the Democrats have to respond to the basic needs bites of the American people. I'm done. And if, if the Democrats, you know, don't, and, you know, if, if, if we keep getting all these Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema games, you know, eventually, eventually it's going to be their downfall. I mean, they, no one is, is going to, uh, no one's going to follow them anymore, you know. Um, so there's more to say. Um, anyone... it's, it's already 10 minutes to yeah. three. And uh, we maybe should just see if there, I mean, we don't want to keep people longer than they need to be, sure. but we should find out whether there's any um, uh, any parting shots that anybody wants to make, maybe one or two more, and then we'll, and then we'll close. Yolanda has a parting shot. Go ahead. And then Ethel. Ethel. Y Yolanda? Yolanda, you're on mute. Look up TPS, temporary protective status, 
and DACA, Biden is going to help with DACA with the DREAMers, but he, but with TPS temporary protective status, which covers about 600,000 people, a lot of them Central Americans, uh, then uh, he could have rescinded Trump's decision to end TPS. He has the, it's on the news, it came on the news, internet news on my phone. So look up. So he, I voted for him to win the, the indictment, will be deported, but he's not taking enough action, and neither on, on the Democrats. I understand, but the Democrats got to step up to the to the to whatever it's called because they're trying to appease those that are anti-immigrants but they got to take into account that there's a lot of us hispanics and there's a lot of people and it's, and it's nepalese and hondureños and um haitians so yeah it's not my party one i agree and i agree with that it's a process ethel go ahead then gloria yeah uh, th thanks. Yeah, I think that this is obviously an ongoing conversation, but this is such a necessary one, you know, that um, what's not readily apparent to necessarily all of my neighbors or the young people that I work with is that this is a battle for power. What they're engaged in is their, you know, their battle for immediate needs. And it's our job to make, to be that bridge about, um, you know, how these fights are integrally connected to the fight for to reconstruct this country, and that they are they are right at the at the they are the leading edge of that, and uh, and 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 to talk to them, it's something you guys talked about at the beginning, but the power that they have and that all of society is really resting on. What is it that the new class does to fight for the life that they need? Um, a book that I've been referring people to. I heard her interview. I have not read it yet. Is Cory Bush. Um, has recently done a very revealing piece about the kind of um, 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 life that she's lived as a proletarian woman. Um, she is a trained nurse, uh, but she also was, she and her children was battered uh, and homeless with her children in cars for quite a while. She is a survivor of rape, um, but, that, uh, but she battled through that. And she also had to survive uh, because at that time, there was still women had the access to the health care to get an abortion. Uh, so she didn't have to carry her rapist seed forward. Um, but she talked about how each of those pieces help frame who she is. Now, this is a woman who is our congressional representative. She's not there to curry favor. She brings all of her proletarian stamp with her and, and her stench, the stench of proletarian women that the rulers do not want, because that means she's lifting up that section that is at the bottom, whether they want it or not. And of course, who was it that thought that the eviction moratorium would stay when no one else did? This little crazed um, woman who's gone through these things. So she talks about that process in her book. It's clear for her, there's not a separation between the mechanism of protest through the ballot box, box and protests on the streets of Ferguson. She's right. brought those together. I think we have to learn from that because it is not one or the other. And so she's brought the men and women, Mike Brown's, the many of them, she's brought them into the floor of Congress. That's what the January 6th piece is about, is to shut that down, that part of America down. And she's not accepting that. And she's bringing, she's broadening that platform. I think we have to think about, that's the juncture that we're in in America right now. And I think that Corey, the Corys, the AOCs, the Miss, I just heard Miss Ilhan Omar do an eloquent, I mean, she's always eloquent, but man, did she use the case of, um, of the attack on um, Paul Pelosi to say, I mean, she is the second most attacked woman, threatened person in fucking Congress. And she really used it to indict this system. Well, you know, um, I celebrate these leaders. They are fighting on multiple fronts. We have got to learn and build, and they are not, just talking to the small people who agree with them. They are bravely taking our status as a class to all of America. And on that basis, when we talk about fighting for basic needs, that's what it is. That's what I see the people in my city doing. I think I understand what's happening in, as I understand what's happening in Chicago as well. Uh, but we don't have a strategy, people are right. Our class doesn't have a strategy. Individual groups have a strategy, but our class doesn't have a strategy. Well, guess what? 
we get to be that bridge instead of not just belly aching. And that's what I love about these kind of meetings because we're saying, how can we, um, revolutionary thinkers, what can we do to leverage this? And so I want to hold up the example of, of Representative um, Corey Bush and Representative Ilhan Omar, just to name a few um, who have bravely held up the experience of proletarian women and let that lead and direct as they think about the question of the battlefield um, for the in the battle for the ballot. Gloria gets the last word. Um, thank you. Yeah, we're we're. Uh, I want to share an expression of the issue of power here in our community. Um, we are in the community are trying to have the definition of public safety be broadened to include lighting, sidewalks, affordable housing, and all. But law enforcement wants to say that they are the most needy. They call themselves public safety, but we are really, you know, trying to uh, encourage people to fight for their own needs that they need in the community. And um, then they're also complaining, or these are police forces, unfortunately, also with firefighters that are trying to say that they are more important than our youth in the community. They want to, in fact, we just had a death in our jail. A 21 year old got assaulted in jail and beaten to death and they're not giving information to the family. So um, just a you know, warning, I, I, I do wanna mention that uh, on the Tribuno del Pueblo, there's an article that I submitted on public safety so that people you know, are able, when they talk, they talk more specifically about the needs of the community. That's all, thank you. Thank you, thank Can I just you add Gloria. one last thing? One of our one of our speakers at an earlier dialogue, Melinda from Kansas, who's in a, a really um, tireless fighter for um, reproductive health and abortion rights, and she talked about that our job has got to be we got to teach the American people that uh, uh, that pro choice is abortion care for women because it's health, and so she talked about how a part of our work has got to be also teaching about the society that we want to see, and I I want to lift up her work as well because they have shown us that these things in, in extremely reactionary towns, they were able to you know, win a victory for uh, working class people in the state of Kansas. And it's going up again. They're voting on there again or so. Eric. Oh, hello. Um, all right. Um, I believe we don't have any more questions or any more. Um, I think it's on me now. Yeah. So Lou, go ahead. So, um, I just want to, first of all, thank everybody for your participation, uh, this afternoon. It's really been remarkable. Um, is there anybody here who hasn't liked this evening, this afternoon? Anybody here who who thinks it was a terrible day? I think uh, I think I think it's unanimous. Um, so I think everybody here has contributed to it, and I think that's what's important. Um, this program has been brought to you by the League of Revolutionaries for New America. In case we haven't made that clear before, the League, or Lerna for short, um, on November thirteenth, the National Cultural Committee of the League will be hosting a cultural workers conference. On November 19th, the Basic Needs Electoral Committee of the League will be hosting a conversation to evaluate elections and what we can expect. And I want you to know that the links to these will be found in the chat before this day is this, evening, this afternoon is over and they'll be emailed to everybody so you'll be able to participate. Um, the League's been around for almost 30 years. We come from all walks of life. I came into the movement many years ago through a connection to the farm workers movement in the Central Valley of California. My work in the league has brought me in connection with some of the most amazing revolutionary cultural workers. What the league brings to the table is a treasury of strategic thinking based in a storehouse of centuries of revolutionary activity that existed long before we did. 
we aim to connect with and become part of the ongoing movement for the basic needs of the people. And I think that's been spoken to very eloquently today. That's the ongoing movement that we see being expressed in the ballot box battles and far beyond. We invite you to read our newspaper, Rally, which you can access online, and to join or build your own committee of the league to help develop our common strategic understanding and activity necessary to defeat the fascist upsurge that we have in part been talking about today. You can contact us through learna.org, our website, or connect with us through the other social media links you'll also find in the chat. Thanks to all again for being here. Thanks to the presenters. Thanks to the marvelous tech team behind the scenes. We're going to end with a poem by a recently uh, deceased comrade, Bill Watkins, a learner member who was a US, University of Illinois professor of education. This was this, this performance of this poem was the first and only time he shared his poems publicly. He said he wrote a little every night over a glass of gin, and he wondered whether his drunken musings were actually poetry, and I think the audience said that it was, and he was pleased to find that. Uh, after, I, I lured Billy to, to, this meet, to the meeting at which he read this. Uh, it was an outdoor meeting, and um, it was a poem, uh, an evening uh, that was memorable to him. And he said, uh, said that that night, he died a week after this. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna ask Rand to play Exposed. Uh, next up is going to be Billy Watkins and an all around revolutionary. Everyone please give it up for Billy. I am uh, both happy and humbled uh, to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm not a poet. I was lured here. My day job is I'm a professor at UIC. I've been there for 20 years. Uh, I'm tired of them. They're probably tired of me. Probably I should retire. But at any rate, uh, until that happens, I, I'm a part of the movement. We're called together today to talk about war condemn war. Well, I was brought up in the Cold War, and I was thinking about some of the old cold warriors who helped shape our world, or I should say misshape our world. And so these guys that we got today in the Pentagon and and launching uh, these adventures, they are poop butts compared to the people you had back in the 1960s. I mean, you had some real pros that were assembled to, in fact, reconfigure the world. So let me just read some of my thoughts. And, and I call this exposed. Divine one, king, emperor, sovereign, his highness, sire, your majesty, landlord, hereditary and bloodline, elected by no one. Speak to God. You go by many names. We know who you are. We got your number. We're on your ass. Democrat, reformer, liberal, progressive, humanitarian, neoliberal, Kennedyite, New Dealer, New Wheeler. You go by many names. We know who you are. We got your number. We're on your ass. Usurper, hater, exploiter, robber baron, expansionist, smooth criminal, imperialist, pig, evildoer, vermin, trickster, wicked one. You are known by many names. We know who you are. We got your number. We're on your ass. <laughs> Liar, cheater, misleader, fool, herder, killer, wannabe thriller. 
We know who you are. We got your number. We're on your ass. <laughs> Reagan, Clinton, Eisenhower, Truman, Wilson, Obama, and yes, Jimmy Carter, the peanut man. You go by many names. We know who you are. We got your number. We're on your ass. Stockman, Plockman, Horman, Hockman, Gates, Vidoliak, Cheney, Kennedy, Fukuyama, Rumsfeld, McGeorge Bundy. What mother would name her child McGeorge? You go by many names. We know who you are. We got your number. We're on your ass. Wallace, Bill Bo, Maddox, Stennis, Connor. You go by many names. We know who you are. We got your number. We're on your ass. Mortgage man, rent man, landlord man, police man, collector man, bag man, dope man, repo man, hit man, older man. You go by many names. We know who you are. We got your number. We're on your ass. Faker. False prophet. Apostate. Revisionist. Snake man. God man. Obia man. Con man. Trick man. Low down man. You go by many names. We know who you are. Come on.